The Secret History by Donna Tartt is an academic novel considered the foundation of the dark academia aesthetic. The sentiment toward this novel is rather polarized among the people who have read it. Most either love it or hate it. Those who love it do so not just for the novel's daunting story, but for the classic themes, allusions, and portrayal of elitism. Those who hate the novel do so for the same reasons. They accuse the novel of snobbery and hate how awful and therefore unrelatable the characters are. I love this novel because of how hateful the characters are for its gothic themes and especially because of the catharsis the story elicits. That being said, I believe that the novel's classic allusions, themes, and aesthetics overshadow its literary accomplishments. We focus so much on the story's aesthetic that we cannot see the diamond beneath the veneer. So in this video, I will discuss why the secret history can be considered a late modernist masterpiece. As often happens with most literary movements, academics cannot agree about the period in which American modernism happened. But the publication of works that are considered modernist ranges from the 1880s to the 1940s. The Secret History was written in the 1980s, which places the work in the postmodern literary period. The problem is that Donatard was heavily inspired by the modernist movement to write the Secret History, drawing elements from works such as Evelyn Woo's Bright's Heads Revisited, Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, and T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. This left us with a work that is informed both by the postmodern elements of the period in which it was written and by the themes of the modernist works that influenced the writer. Therefore, I think we could do both a postmodern and a modernist reading of the text. I know this sounds crazy, but to me this makes a lot of sense. What I see is that Donna Tart, an author who loves ancient and classic literature, was reacting to a period when these literary works were no longer considered relevant and were dismissed as snobbery. In other words, Donatar might be expressing her own modernist crisis through her novel. In the novel, the characters even express their disdain for postmodernism. In a scene where Richard and a girl talk about another student, Richard thinks, I knew Gartrell, he was a bad painter and a vicious gossip, with a vocabulary composed almost entirely of obscenities, Gottschall burps and the word postmodernist. In the 80s, there was a revival of ancient studies. But the problem was that Donna Tartt was writing her novel in an environment that undermined that renewed interest. In Once Upon a Time at Bennington College, a podcast about the artistic environment in which Donna Tartt and Brett Easton Ellis wrote their first novels, the host, Lily Analik, describes Bennington as a college of experimental education in which the students and professors alike were given the freedom to do as they please to break the molds of the educational system. Analik is not alone. According to Kaplan, Bennington was a kind of omphalos of refined depravity, money and drugs and hormones and scholarship. This was a college in which the students and professors were super edgy. There were a lot of drugs and people experimenting with different forms of art. So Donna Tartt might have been reacting to the anarchy of that environment, the same environment that inspired her to write The Secret History. One of the main elements of postmodernism is that it tries to elevate pop culture while lowering the importance of high culture. Pop culture is contemporary art that is accessible to the masses, such as comic books, rock and roll, and TV shows. And high culture is classic art that has reached a certain level of prestige, and is not very accessible to the masses, like opera, ballet, classical music, and literature. According to M. H. Abrams, postmodernism tries to overthrow the elitism of modernist high art by recourse for models to the mass culture in film, television, newspaper cartoons, and popular music. I'm bringing this up because this is something Donna Tart certainly doesn't do. Pop culture couldn't be more absent from the secret history. We barely hear any reference to music and TV shows from the 80s. And whenever the novel gives the readers a hint of the time period, it is usually through outsiders from the classics group, such as Judy Povey. The group's disconnection to the outside world is such that Henry is not even aware of the moon landing. 
What Donatar does is elevate classic art and literature through the many allusions and insertions of Latin, Greek, and French. This is something that Tart takes from T.S. Eliot. For instance, Eliot uses multiple allusions to works written in English and other languages in the wasteland. To understand these references, you have to understand the other language and the context in which the reference was written. At the same time, that allusion informs the main story. For example, on page 86, Henry quotes from Madame Bovary regarding Camilla and her dog. Sa pensée s'embout d'abord vagabonder au hasard comme sa lèvrette qui faisait des cercles dans la campagne. The relation between Camilla and Madame Bovary emphasizes Camilla's romantic fickleness. On page 197, when they are conspiring against Bonnie, Francis and Henry quote Charles Baudelaire Les Fleurs du Mal. The poem in question is called Le Lété, and it is about a man consumed by his love for a woman. The fragment the characters quote translate to to sleep better than live in a dream as sweet or as subtle as death. But the full line is, I want to sleep rather than live in a dream as sweet or as subtle as death. Although through the fragment, it seems as though the allusion reflects Henry and Francis' exhausted mental state and foreshadows Bunny's murder. When you read the poem, you realize that the allusion actually foreshadows Henry's sacrifice because the speaker of the poem sees himself as a martyr. The poem is also related to Henry's devotion to Camilla and mirrors Richard's dream at the end. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the Lethe is a river in Hades whose waters cause drinkers to forget their past. Although in the novel, none of the characters will be able to forget their past, they all end up stuck in a mental limbo. Even Richard's dream suggests that Henry is stuck in a spiritual limbo. The secret history also conveys many themes present in other modernist works. Some of the main themes of modernism are cultural loss, fragmentation, isolation, and spiritual homelessness. I want to compare the secret history and the wasteland to see how they relate. I chose the wasteland for two main reasons. The first one is that this poem is the epitome of modernist literature and inspire many other modernist works. And the second is that Donatart took so much inspiration from T.S. Eliot's life and works. In the second stanza of The Wasteland, the speaker states, Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images. Throughout the poem, there are fragments of conversation happening. These conversations are sometimes shallow and incoherent because the characters struggle to communicate their feelings. This reflects a lack of physical and emotional connection between the characters. Something similar happens in the secret history. Each one of the characters experience a sense of fragmentation. The only things that bring them emotionally and physically together are their love for ancient studies and the murder of Bunny. However, each one of them is isolated in different ways. For Richard, his inferiority complex and subsequent lies to fit in set him apart from the group. For Francis, it is his homosexuality what hinders him from being more open about himself. For the twins, it is their incestuous relationship. As for Henry, I see him both as the genius who is miserable because in his eyes the world is unremarkable and as the wounded hero. Like a hero in one of Hemingway's stories, whose physical wound reflects a psychological wound and both prevent him from establishing meaningful connections. That to me is the case with Henry because of his car accident. The only one who seems normal in this sense is Bunny. Yes, he is racist, homophobic and misogynist, but he is the only one who has a life outside the group, who has friends and a relationship. In contrast, the others only have themselves, but it little matters how much time they spend together. They keep many secrets from each other. It's not until the end that Richard sees the whole picture. The more the plot progresses, the more their secrets create a sense of betrayal, neurosis, and a chasm among the group members. The secrets are what end up breaking them apart. This isolation extends to the reader. Richard is a non-reliable narrator, and his story leaves us with more questions than answers. 
The novel alienates the readers because we never get to know each character's version of the events. Remember the heap of broken images? Many scholars believe that these broken images refer not only to a fragmentation of the self, but also to actual images of idols, like statues or paintings. Figures that are not godlike, but that humans have turned into gods. Again, this is something that is present in the secret history. Although, with the exception of Bonnie, most of the characters consider themselves Catholics, it seems that their religion is not enough to sustain their spiritual hunger. They enact a bacchanal ritual not just out of curiosity. Rituals are collective activities in which a bond is established among those participating. Rituals also enhance people's spirituality. The fact that the characters fail so many times at enacting the ritual and keep trying reflects their spiritual homelessness. There is also the problem with Julian, who becomes a godlike figure to the group, a farce contributing to their downfall. Look at this fragment from the Wasteland Stud part titled The Fire Sermon. The river bears no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk handkerchief, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed. And their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors, departed, have left no addresses. The speaker states that the nymphs, the guardians of rivers, have departed from the Thames. This conveys the loss of myth and magic necessary to see the world's beauty. The river bears no empty bottles, sandwich paper, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. This fragment conveys how not even the waste of humanity has left an imprint in the world. The lines the loitering as of city directors departed has left no addresses emphasize an annihilation of humankind, but especially of our existence. There's no proof left that Earth has ever been a home to humanity. There's also a connection between the nymphs and the city directors, indicating that people have replaced godlike figures and mythical figures with authority figures. Overall, we can interpret this passage as a warning, showing that humanity can leave an imprint behind only through meaningful things and not through shallow things. In the secret history, the character's obsession with the past does not allow them to appreciate the present. They don't know how to create, they only know how to destroy. Take for example Henry's sacrifice to save his friends from going to prison. At the end of the day, all the knowledge of this remarkable young man is wasted. His death is in vain because he cannot save his friends from the imprisonment of their guilt. You can see the spiritual decay in which Richard, Camilla, Francis and Charles live at the end. They have nothing to cling on anymore. Their love for ancient studies is what brings their downfall. That's the tragedy. Julian turns out to be a farce and Henry is gone. All that remains is a spiritual wasteland at the end. It is also no coincidence that the hotel where Camilla and Henry stay is called the Albemol, the name of the hotel where T.S. Eliot stayed when he was revising the wasteland. This is not the only T.S. Eliot allusion regarding Henry and Camilla. There is a scene in the novel where Richard, Henry and Camilla go to the lake and use the boat. That day, Henry was talking about Elizabeth and Lester. I remember the murdered wife, the royal barge, the queen on a white horse talking to the troops at Tilbury Fort and Leicester and the Earl of Essex holding the bridal rein. The switch of the oars and the hypnotic throng of dragonflies blended with his academic monotone. Camilla, flushed and sleepy, trailed her hand in the water. Yellow birch leaves blew from the trees and drifted down to rest on the surface. It was many years later and far away when I came across this passage in the wasteland. Elizabeth and Leicester beating oars the stem was formed, a gilded shell, red and gold, the brisk swell, ripple both shores, southwest wind, carried downstream the peals of bells, white towers. 
and there's a musical insertion there. We could argue that Henry's monologue reflects his devotion to Camilla, that he was talking about Elizabeth and Lester because the moment reminded him of them. Richard's allusion to the wasteland is only a product of Camilla and Henry's tragic love story. In the poem, Elizabeth and Lester are in the Thames, the same river that becomes part of the wasteland of humanity. In other words, Richard foreshadows Camilla and Henry's relationship and how nothing but death comes out of it. In American modernism, the geographical movement of the characters often reflects their intention to grow or change. This motif is very present in The Secret History, where the character's hometown is often a topic of discussion in regards to who they are. For instance, Bunny is from Connecticut, which is in the Northeast. So he and his family are the embodiment of old American stock and the ruined American aristocracy. In a scene, Richard asks Bunny, if Henry's from St. Louis, how did he get to be so smart? Bonnie replies, Henry had a bad accident when he was a little boy. The Midwest is often associated with inexperience and lack of sophistication. So that's why Richard questions Henry's intelligence. Nonetheless, we must remember that Henry has settled in the Northeast to study ancient studies. The East stands for the past and it often represents traditional social conventions and worldviews. The West stands for the future and it represents progress and the American dream. In the secret history, Richard also goes from California, which is in the West, to Vermont, which is in the Northeast. His parents also own a gas station, which means that although they are not wealthy, they have some acquisitive power. Besides, oil is a symbol of the nouveau riche class. Even Bonnie thinks that Richard's family has oil wells because Richard comes from the Golden West. We could say that in Richard's eyes, his family represents the new middle class. To him, they are ordinary, unremarkable, and pragmatic. And like the Nouveau Riche, they like to pretend to be something they are not. I don't know if you remember this part of the book, but they kind of pretend that Richard doesn't exist so they can hang out with another childless couple. The irony is that Richard also pretends to be someone he is not throughout the story. Richard's migration from the west to the northeast reflects his rejection of commonness and newness and his attraction to the past, his love for the picturesque and ancient studies. Like many other modernist works, the secret history romanticizes the past, while at the same time showing the consequences of that romanticization. So that is the end of this video. Please let me know in the comments if you have read The Secret History and if you have, I would like to know how do you see The Secret History? Do you see it more as a modernist work or as a postmodernist work? Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely week and I'll see you on the next video. Bye!